Good day everyone, my name's Lee Betts and I'm a professional poker player from Melbourne, Australia. About a year ago, I was grinding 2.5 full time and I decided to create a vlog series to sort of track my sessions as I did it. But earlier this year, because of coronavirus, the casino actually had to shut down. So I made the transition over to online poker. At the moment, I'm grinding 100NL 9 max games and we've got a brand new session to go over today. Before we hop into the session, I haven't been playing my best the past few sessions that we've gone over in the vlog, and I do think there's a reason why I'm not quite playing as best as I could. I really am making a lot of mistakes because my energy levels are pretty low. The gyms just opened up in Victoria two weeks ago, and I think I'm investing a lot of my energy physically into training at the gym. I've been going hard at it. I want to make some gains, but it has come at the cost of my skill level when I'm playing poker. Definitely making more mistakes than I should be. So in order to combat that, I've actually gotten rid of my 1,500 hand daily goal. And I've just decided that I'll play as much poker as I can as long as I still feel like I'm on my A game. But when I do start to make careless mistakes or I do stuff that I know I shouldn't be doing, I can end the session straight away. Whether that's after 200 hands or whether that's after 2,000 hands, just end it when I'm not feeling my best. This will result in me having less volume, which is an issue, but I do hope as my body acclimatizes and once I do get more calories in my diet, that things will change around. This is just a temporary measure to make sure I don't get too far off track and go on a big downswing and stuff. With that out of the way, let's get into today's session. So here is today's session that we're gonna review. You can see that I did get in a total of 781 hands, which is a lot less than I typically do in these vlogs. But like I explained, this was sort of the point where I started noticing myself making a few careless mistakes and I'm like, Let's not push myself just to get volume in and end up getting another D plus session. And at that point, I'd accumulated a profit of 236. That doesn't really tell the picture of how I played though. We know I didn't make any catastrophic mistakes. I did leave early, but how did I play exactly? Well, we've got the most interesting hand histories from the session to get into and see how I played. First hand up, we get a limp from a loose passive player. Then the action falls to me on the button with pocket 10s. I go ahead and ISO raise to five, and then the limper calls. So we go heads up to a flop. That is a bang of flop. It is 10, nine, five with two hearts. When the limper checks it over to me here, I think we do have a few interesting options here. I definitely want to bet though. I don't want to be checking a hand this strong on a board this wet. I think a loose passive opponent is pretty much going to call with all of the pairs in their range as well as flush draws overcard type stuff. So we definitely want to get value. The decision is between whether we want to bet small or we want to bet large. There is always going to be merit to betting small with top set because you do block the strongest continues in your opponent's range. If they do have elasticity between, you know, they'll only call bigger bets with their top pair hands and then they'll, you know, when you do bet bigger, they'll sort of start to fold out the pairs. In this specific instance though, against an opponent like this, I think I'm going to be losing a lot of EV if I don't size up with a bet just because I think they're going to float so, so wide here. So I do decide to go ahead and bet eight and then they do call. So we head off to a turn, which is the five of spades. So we turn a full house. The villain checks it over to us again. And again, we have another interesting decision with what size we want to bet. Some people do like trapping with full houses to let people hit flushes and stuff to try and you know stack them if they make a flush. But I do think there are some drawbacks to that. For one, it's not as deceptive as you might think when the person leads out with a flush and then you jam. They're probably going to be able to figure out you might have some full houses in your range. So I really don't like that option even against an opponent like this. Against an opponent like this though, I just want to keep betting. I want to get value from their flush draws and their pairs. They might even still call me with a nine when there is a flush draw. They might put me on a flush draw if I keep barreling so big. So I go ahead and bet. 22, which I'm actually pretty happy with this decision against this opponent type because they do call. So heads up to the river. The river is the nine of spades. Really, really interesting river. The villain does go ahead and check it over to us. I do think there is some possibility that they would have a leading range here if they had a five or a nine just to try and get max value when I do have an over pair. So I do wonder if their range is condensed a bit by them not having a leading range. So when the action's on me here, I don't really think I can bet really, really big here. If I thought my opponent did have a nine or a five in their range, I would really like probably even over bet all in just because I think those hands are going to call all of the time regardless of sizing. 
But I do think the fact that my opponent checked and the fact that they might raise a five on the turn and they might even fold a nine on the turn, maybe not this opponent, I really think it's unlikely they have those super, super strong hands. So the hands I'm going to try and get value from with a bet here, it's going to be a 10, maybe a nut flush draw that really likes this river because they know ace high has value now. So, But I'm going to need to size down to get value from those hands. So I go ahead and bet 21. The other possible benefit of betting this small if my opponent does somehow have a nine or a five they might check raise to try and stack my over pairs like i said earlier though i do think they're not going to have as many nines and fives in their range as if they because i do think they would lead a lot of them so i go ahead and bet 21 then my opponent is in the tank for a good 15 seconds before throwing in the call we love to see that news and we're definitely going to scoop in this pot. So really happy that I did size up on the early streets and I think that made me realise pretty much maximum EV in this hand. Okay, next up we get two limps from loose passive players. The actions in me and the cutoff with Jack Tennis Spades and I think I have a few options here. I could just go ahead and fold if you're going to play a raise or fold strategy, which... I think you guys know at this point in the vlog is what I like to do pre-flop, then folding is absolutely a fine option just because there are a few drawbacks to raising. Whilst Jack-10 suited is a strong hand, taking it multi-way against passive opponents, it can be just giving away money a bit. If you get three bet, that's a really awkward spot as well. So there is some merit to folding. If you are going to have an over-limping strategy, this might be a fine hand to use. I don't play that strategy though. I raise or fold and I decide to raise this time. Also, there are those drawbacks to raising. It is good to have a hand like Jack-10 suited for ball coverage. And if either of the opponents limp fold or maybe both of them limp fold, you just take down the action preflop, which is fine with no matter what hand you're going to raise with. So I go ahead and ISO to five and a half. Then a loose aggressive button calls as do both of the limpers. So we're off four ways to a flop of... Queen Jack 6, Rainbow, with our backdoor spades. When the action's checked to me, I just want to check here. In multi-way pots, I really don't like c-betting into multiple people. Even with really strong queen or over pairs, it can be a bit dicey just because we've got three ranges, all of which could have us beat. I think all of them are going to have Queen Jack, pocket sixes, uh, Queen 6 suited. Makes sense for the limpers as well, Jack 6 suited. So I could get value from straight draws and overcar floats, but I think 4-way... Better off just playing it a bit cautious. I check, and then the button does as well. So we're off to the turn, which is six spades. So pretty good turn for us. We do turn a flush draw and it pairs bottom pair. And then the action checked over to me again. And a pretty interesting decision here, whether we want to bet or not. The reasons I would like checking are, if we do bet and get called, there is a decent chance we're going to be behind. If someone did check a queen on the flop, they're just definitely going to call down. And to try and get value from worse hands, it'd probably have to be like the ace high flush draw, maybe... I think pocket sevens might even fold to a bet, which sort of makes betting really unattractive. What makes betting attractive, though, is we do have a strong hand with a lot of equity. So even if we do get caught by a queen, then we have outs to improve on that. But equity denial is going to be as good as well, because if the river comes an ace or a king, there's definitely a chance we can lose, and we can just take down the pot now. So there's merits to both checking and betting. I decide to bet, though, pushing my strong equity. I go ahead and bet 13, and then the... Button folds. One of the limpers goes ahead and check raises me to 36. The other player folds. So heads up here. I think when my opponent goes ahead and raises to this size, I don't want to go ahead and fold just because I am getting pretty good odds to draw to my flush draw in position. But additionally, I do have showdown value as well with my jack. So I do decide to call here. I am somewhat concerned that this opponent could have a 6x hand though, being that they limp call preflop, I think they're going to have a lot of like A6 offsuit, 6-5 offsuit type stuff, so they do have a lot of sixes in their range. I'm just calling and hoping to hit a spade or a jack, because I think against this opponent type, I am probably pretty likely to get paid off if I get there. So we're off to the river. The river's a seven of hearts, and then the opponent checks it over to me now, and I think I just want to go ahead and check back. I really do think my opponent would go all in with most of their sixes as a lead, but if they did want to get tricky and trap it, I don't want to just pay them off for the rest of a bet. So I do go ahead and check back. I'm hoping to be in a nut flush draw, which is something else they could have. So we do end up seeing what they have. And it was pocket 10s, so very unconventional line from pocket 10s there. But I mean, what do I care? We're going to scoop in this pot. 
Next up, we get a limp from a loose passive under the gun, then another early position player isos it to four and a half, a loose aggressive opponent. So when the action's on me in the cutoff, I have a slam dunk no-brainer decision to go ahead and three bet to 15. And then things get a bit interesting because a loose passive big blind actually decides to cold call the 15. And I will say, if this was a tighter opponent, I would be considering that their range would be a bit more condensed to stronger hands. Like I see this a lot with Ace King offsuit, pocket jacks, pocket tens, stuff that's like, it's a strong hand, but they just don't want to fold a preflop, but they don't want to go ahead and four bet either because they understand that the early position three bet dynamic is going to be pretty tight range of hands. But against this opponent in particular, they're always passive. They're probably going to have Ace nine offsuit in this scenario, pocket two, stuff like that as well. So they throw in the call and then the original raiser calls as well. So we're three ways to a flop, eight, six, three with two diamonds. And then here's where things get really interesting. The preflop caller decides to lead out for 32. The initial early position raiser folds and the action's back on me here. And I do think there are a few interesting options. I definitely could see just calling here. My opponent could potentially be bluffing with like ace king or a flush draw or even like something like Jack-10, and by calling, we're going to enable them to keep bluffing off in the hand, but I actually really, really like raising in this spot. I think we're going to get a lot of value from those pocket pairs that are in my opponent's range. So pocket nines, pocket tens, pocket jacks. But then I can also get value from nut flush draw hands, combo draw type hands. So the only thing I'm concerned about is sets, and there are a bunch of hands I can still get value from. So I decide to raise it up. I decided to go all in just because I really don't want the turn to be an ace and then my opponent gets scared off with pocket jacks. I would just rather get all the money in now as soon as possible. The raise might be a bit too big though. It's such an awkward SPR. I'm not really sure how I should be sizing it. So I do land on all in. I think I maybe could be a bit more creative and raise to like 80 or something, which leaves a very small SPR. But I mean, that might be better. I might get called a bit more often, particularly by those flush draw hands. So the action gets back to the big blind, and they're in the tank probably a good 10 seconds before folding, unfortunately. So we definitely might have missed a bit of value if we did raise to a smaller size or maybe keep trapping. Not really sure about my line. What do you think about my shove on the flop? Hop in the comments below. Let me know what you think. Super curious to hear your opinions on this hand. Next up, we get an early position raise from a loose aggressive player to two and a half. Then they get a cold call from a loose passive player. Then the action folds me in the small blind with pocket queens. Another slam dunk, easy three bet here. Three bet and pocket queens a lot today. I go ahead and make it 12 and a half. And the action's back on the early position raiser. And they don't call and they don't fold. They go ahead and four bet to 32 and a half. Then the cold call of fold with queens. And I really am concerned that even as a loose aggressive opponent, this opponent could have us beat. They're going to have all the aces and kings in their range, naturally. They are going to have some ace-king off suit, though. And as a loose aggressive opponent, they are going to have a few bluffs, even in a super tight dynamic like early position versus small blind. So I really don't think I can go anywhere with pocket queens yet. So I take folding off the table, and then it just comes down, do I want to call or do I want a five bet? And I think I much prefer calling then five betting just because if we do go ahead and five bet here we're going to be getting dangerously close to getting stacks all in pre-flop for about 200 big blinds which i really don't want to do with pocket queens because i think my opponent will be pretty reluctant to get it in with worse hands than those so i do decide to call and we're heads up to a flop which is 732 with two spades. I check it over to villain, then they go ahead and C bet 34 and a quarter, which is only half the size of the pot. But when you do consider that this is a four bet pot, this is actually a really big bet. If I do call here, the SPR on the turn is going to be one. So I am very concerned that my opponent could be betting large because they're going to know I have a lot of pocket pairs in my range. So they're just trying to get maximum value when they do have aces or kings. So the large bet just could be indicative of a very strong range. So I actually wouldn't fold anyone for just going ahead and folding on this street if you do mix in that sizing tell. I do decide to call because my opponent is loose aggressive and they could be trying to out-level me and betting big with a bluff. So I, uh, I do throw in the call for that reason, but definitely going to proceed with caution going forward in the hand. Unless the turn's a queen. We turn a set, we turn top set on the Queen of Hearts. So definitely don't need to be as cautious now that we have the nuts. I go ahead and check it over to the villain, hoping that they're going to bet off with bluffs and overpairs. But then they go ahead and check back. 
So off to the river, which is the Jack of Diamonds. Now I think I have an interesting decision here. I could go ahead and check it over to my opponent, hoping that they'll bet off on the river with their overpairs or a bluff potentially, or I could just lead out for value here myself. I decide to go ahead and effectively put the opponent all in. I actually sized it the size of the pod. I should have gone, yeah, 138 to try and get them all in. Regardless though, tiny little error there, but the reason I did go ahead and shove here is because I really don't see my opponent going ahead and betting aces or kings off on the river when the two running cards are pocket queens and pocket jacks. I think they're going to know that I have a lot of pocket queens and pocket jacks in my range, how the hand played out, and I just don't think they're going to go for like thinner value with kings and aces. So to get maximum value from those hands, I really do need to bet myself. The other reason I would consider checking instead of betting is to try and induce bluffs from ace-king or maybe like ace-five suited, something like that, and I'm just skeptical that they would go for it just because when they do have those bluffs in their hand, not only are they going to know we're going to have queens and jacks in our range, but they're also going to be concerned that we have aces or kings ourselves if we didn't play a five-bet range preflop. So I really do think they're going to be timid knowing how strong my range is, and I think I'm better off just shoving myself. I will say, if I did have a bluff in this spot, maybe something like pocket tens or you know, ace-king offsuit myself, I do think this would be a really good spot to lead as a bluff, just because it is going to put pocket aces and pocket kings in such an awkward spot when they know that I do have all the queens and jacks in my range. But with all that out of the way, what does my opponent do? Well, they hit the tank for 10 seconds. There's a lot of tanking tonight before ultimately folding. Ugh. Not what we wanted to see, and we really didn't want to see the tank fold because the tank fold... It's probably going to be one of the overpairs that we did get them off, so missed a bit of value there, and my opponent probably made a good fold. All right, next up, we get a raise from a loose passive player to four, and we've got pocket queens again, and even though a loose passive opponent opening to four is like pretty indicative of strength, in my opinion, and I would not be three-betting this opponent light, when we're as strong as pocket queens, that's not a light three-bet. So we do what we've done two other times in this vlog. We go ahead and three-bet it to 12. Then the action gets back to the loose passive opponent. They throw in the call as well. So heads up to flop. King, Jack, 10 with two clubs. We have the Queen of Clubs. When the opponent checks it over to us, I actually think we have a pretty easy decision to check back on this board. My opponent's range is going to have a lot of Broadway-type hands, so they're definitely going to have all the Ace, Queen offsuit, all the King, Jack offsuit, all the Jack, 10 suiteds for sure, but just basically um, King, Queen offsuit as well. Just basically a bunch of hands that beat us on this board, so playing it cautious does make sense. And additionally, by checking, we can potentially induce bluffs from some of those hands like... Ace-5 suited, pocket nines potentially. So it makes a lot more sense to check. I go ahead and check it. Then we get to see a turn, which is the king of spades. The villain checks it over to me again. And now I think it's a bit more of a close decision, whether I want to bet or not. I would like betting this turn just because I think a loose passive opponent in particular is probably going to overvalue hands like a jack, you know, ace jack, jack 10 suited, queen jack. But I just think we could bet big and potentially get value from those hands. But still prefer checking just because I think my opponent is going to have a lot of ace high hands in their range and a lot of those weaker pocket pairs, which potentially we could induce bluffs from by checking here. So I do decide to check it back, but gun to my head, which decision is better? I think betting for thin value might be a bit better here. So we're off to the river, which is the three of the clubs completing the front door flush. And here's where things get really, really interesting. The villain goes ahead and bets. 32. So they actually go ahead and overbet the pot, put in about half of their stack. And I know I said my plan by checking the turn was to induce bluffs on the river. But I thought my opponent might bluff, you know, like 20 at the maximum. When they go ahead and bet larger than the size of the pot, this is setting off alarm bells. Remember I said on the flop that I think they have a lot of King X hands in their range, hands that are going to be full houses on this run out. I still believe that. I think those hands might check on the turn to try and induce bluffs from my hands are like pocket queens so i really don't discount any of the full houses they can have here i think they can have pocket tens i think they can have pocket jacks i think they can have king queen king 10 they also could have the nut flush draw as well that would be a very reasonable hand for them to try and check call with or try and check raise with at some point so definitely concerned that they do have a very strong range of hands here and i'm looking at what hands could they potentially be bluffing with and i'm like it would have to be ace five of hearts, pocket nines, pocket sixes, something like that. And I really, really don't see it. If they have all those hands, they can have pocket threes as well, which is another value hand we have to be concerned with. So 
Even though we played the hand to bluff catch on the river, when my opponent bets the river, we're gonna go ahead and fold it. I go ahead and fold the river there with my pocket queens. And you can't actually see it here on the recording, but my opponent did flash the jack of diamonds. So I do think, even though a jack, like, they're trying to show it to make it look like they were overvaluing ace jack or jack 10 or something, I really do think the chances they have pocket jacks or king jack is like very, very high. The fact that their line looks really strong and that they flashed a jack, I'm absolutely stoked with this fold. Really happy that I pulled the trigger on it. So there you go, those were the most interesting hands we played across the session. It's a few less than usual, but I don't wanna bore you guys with a bunch of like standard seabed and three bet spots. Naturally, if I'm putting in less volume, there's gonna be less interesting hands to go over. So it's just more incentive for me to start putting in good, proper, long volume, so we can get more interesting hands out for you and so I can start making more money. Regardless though, how did we play across this session? For today's gameplay grade, I'm going to give myself a B plus. I do really like most of the decisions I made across today. The only thing holding me back from an A is I really don't want to go too hard with punishing myself for lack of volume because that is kind of the plan at the moment. But I mean, come on, 780 hands in a day. I can do way better than that. That's like three hours of play at most. So I, I, I do want to just pull myself a little bit back for that. But also that hand with the pocket queens where I shoved over my opponent's lead on the flop. I think I could have eked a bit more value out of them with a lot of the hands in their range if I raised to a smaller size. So it's just sort of some, one of those things that needs fine tuning, you know. I think I made the right play by raising. I just raised too much and sort of wrecked it. So definitely a few mistakes that I can learn and improve from, but a vast improvement from the last vlog where I just made egregious mistake after egregious mistake. And happy to see myself heading back in a positive direction. I do think this strategy of playing less hands in a day is working out. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. As always, I really do appreciate it because it helps the channel's analytics a lot. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. We're putting out these online poker vlogs. A lot of people have come on recently. We've had a big surge of subscribers, so I really do appreciate everyone that has clicked that button. And if you haven't already, come on, join the family. Also, hit the thumbs up button and leave a comment. Need on me for being a big fish in these hands. I can take it. I'm a big boy. Come on. Needle me with it. It's all good. For now, I'm out of here. Peace.